Okay, good morning, everyone. It's uh, 11 o'clock, right on the dot. Um, so we'll get started with the webinar. This is my, I'm Sherito Galing. Uh, you normally hear my colleague Tina Chen from the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health facilitating these webinars. But Tina is, is on holidays this week, so I'm trying to fill her big shoes. I'm going to do her my best. Um, and I'm here with Linda, who's going to be helping with the technical aspects of the GoToMeeting platform. Um, we have a awesome, um, we have a great uh, presentation from Mayor Lisa Helps this morning from the City of Victoria. And um, Mayor Helps is uh, uh, got a time restriction this morning, so we're just going to be going from 11 to 12. Uh, we had scheduled an hour and a half, but we can always continue after after the mayor has to um, has to excuse herself. But uh, we've got one hour with the mayor, so I'm going to get started as soon as possible. I've just got a few intro slides um, to go through with you, and I'll just put those up here. There's a bit of a delay, so we'll start from the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health. There we go. Um, so, yeah, so um, so welcome again. I see that there's about 31 people online, which is awesome. Thanks for calling in. Um, and just wanted to say a little bit about these, this online forum webinar series. It started as part of the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health, uh, a collaboration with the BC Center for Disease Control, which is where I am working from. And we started these webinars a few months ago, we launched in November last year, and they're a part of a series of monthly webinars on healthy built environment topics. And we're, our purpose is to try to facilitate a pan-Canadian conversation, info sharing, and trying to broaden awareness of what is healthy built environments and what is the amazing work that we're all doing in, in different provinces. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm Sherito Galing. I'm going to be facilitating this webinar. We're going to have about 30 minutes presentation from, from Mayor Health, and then we'll have 30 minutes discussion. And um, we're trying to foster cross, cross um, sectoral questions. So I'm going to ask if people have questions or additional points that they'd like to bring forward, you can always put them in the chat box, and myself and Lisa will bring them forward for you. Or you can send us a chat, and then we'll unmute you you can verbally present your question or, or um, comment yourself. So we have the great pleasure of introducing Lisa Helps. She's the mayor of the city of Victoria here in BC. Mayor Helps believes it's her job as mayor of Victoria to employ business sensibilities and community values to lead an organization that serves all of its citizens. With a transparent and common sense approach to decision making, Mayor Helps has championed both citizen-led and local business-led in a variety of areas. She's leading a transformation at City Hall in order to foster a more innovative, proactive, and responsive culture to meet and exceed the needs of residents and the business community. Um, so we are recording this presentation, but just for our own internal purposes for our notes, and that will be deleted after we do the notes. Um, after the webinar, you're going to receive a link to the evaluation survey, and we would really appreciate your comments on this webinar series forum platform on the NCCH in general um, so that we can improve and better meet your needs in the future. I'm just hearing a little bit of background noise there, and so if you're if you're not Mayor Health, if you could please mute yourself, <laughs> it would be appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. And so I'm going to get the slides up here, and Mayor Health, I'll, I'll ask you to take it away. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, or uh, in some cases, good afternoon. Um, I'm actually in Ottawa right now. So um, it, it's afternoon here, but I really want to thank all of you for tuning in. And uh, I'm going to be as expedient as I can in moving through the slides so that we have ample time for discussion. 
So the title of the talk is A Well-Being Mandate, City Building in the 21st Century. Um, and I'm firmly of the belief after having been mayor for just over four years now that city building, the way we build cities, the way we live in cities, uh, is a significant, uh, has significant contributions to creating health and well-being. Uh, next slide. There we go. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so the, the questions that I wanna focus on today and that maybe some of you are focusing on in your work and your daily lives is how can we build cities that build well-being? Uh, how do we ensure that everyone benefits from ongoing change uh, as cities grow and change, as the world grows and changes? So there's an equity question as well. And then how can city hall and citizens work together to ensure that key community values like well-being and the protection of our natural environment are enhanced even as the city continues to grow and change? So these questions are, are very, uh, the, I guess the last one in particular is very Victoria focused. Um, our, our city is going through rapid change right now, uh, rapid urbanization. Uh, we're, we're waking up from a small sleepy capital into a small global city. And it's really important that even as we grow and change, we grapple with these questions of whose well-being is enhanced and how do we ensure the general well-being of everyone and protection of the natural environment, uh, even as we continue to grow. Uh, next slide. So I just want to focus on these uh, elements of well-being, and they'll be familiar to you, but I want to just outline uh, where in particular these come from and what influence they've had on the work that we're doing at the City of Victoria. So just after I was elected as mayor uh, in 2014, I maybe it was even during the campaign, I read um, a report, it was called the Report on the Commission of the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress. And it's uh, by Joseph Stieglitz and Amrita Sen. They're the lead authors. And the report came from the uh, the president of France in 2007 was dissatisfied with measuring uh, GDP uh, only as a way to measure progress. And so he commissioned Stieglitz and Sen and a number of economists and others from around the world to investigate how do we, even as we continue to perform economically as cities and, and nations, how do we also measure social progress? And so these seven, uh, sorry, eight elements here uh, were the elements that were determined to be uh, most important if we're looking at kind of the general well-being of, of people and communities. So you can see them there for yourself, material living standards, health, education, personal activities, including meaningful work, political voice, social connections and relationships, healthy environment and economic and physical security. And just to give one example, and again, this may be a very familiar to, to many of you, um, it, and it comes from Charles Montgomery's uh, Happy Cities book, but how if we're only measuring economic progress and GDP, we're, we're, we're sometimes missing well-being. And so Charles Montgomery gives the example of commuting. So commuting is great for GDP. It means more vehicles, more gas, more roads, all of those things that grow GDP. Um, but uh, studies uh, that, that Charles cites have shown uh, over time a decrease in well-being as a result of commuting. Um, you know, more stress, more marital breakups, uh, less physical activity, all of those things. And so that's just the most obvious example to cite how I think we need as cities uh, and as countries a, a more robust way to measure progress. And so this work that came out of France has been taken up uh, by John Helliwell, who's a UBC professor and others, and they produce now a world happiness report where they look at the genuine well-being using these indicators and others uh, around the world every year uh, in over 170 countries to, to measure these things uh, and to give us, uh, as political leaders and policymakers, a report card. And so all of that is to say this is the very wide frame into which I brought um, my, my role as mayor and through which we've done strategic planning at the city. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what has put Victoria on the map historically? Uh, for those of you who have been to Victoria, you will recognize the next few slides. So next slide, and these are meant to be in rapid pace, they're just for fun. So one of the things that's put us on the ba uh, map are our hanging baskets. Uh, next slide. High tea at the Empress. What are others saying about us now? Uh, Victoria has been known for hanging baskets and high, de high tea and as the place uh, as, uh, as for the newly wed and nearly dead. That was a, a phrase that was coined about us some time ago. But as you can see, and this is just one snippet we've received and are receiving kind of a different look about who we are and the cool Victoria is no longer uh, just the, the newly wed and nearly dead. And some may take offense to that term, oh. I didn't create it. But uh, it really, uh, it, it shows, and again, I could show you many more slides like this. It shows a city in transition. Next, next slide. 
And this, this slide is just meant to illustrate the amount of construction and development that's happening in Victoria. If you came to our city right now, you would see uh, almost a crane on every corner. Um, a lot of uh, rental buildings under construction, about 40% of what's under construction are rentals for the first time in a long time. Uh, a lot of condos and some office buildings downtown as well. So our city is growing and changing. Uh, and, and that's why a, a focus on well-being and genuine um, health uh, and, and building cities for healthy people is, is critically important at this point in Victoria and at any city, in any city there's, where there's significant change. Uh, next slide. So this is the key question that's motivating all of our actions. And I was just uh, re-elected in October with a very forward-looking council, and we've uh, recreated or created a second strategic plan for our second mandate. And it focuses, I think, even more on well-being uh, and healthy cities than did the first plan. And so this is the question that keeps us all up at night. Uh, how do we keep Victoria livable even while we grow? And this picture here is, uh, is from Beacon Hill Park. Uh, and what I'm going to show you next are just a series of interventions in public space that, that help us to, to keep Victoria uh, and create Victoria as a healthy people place, again, even as we continue to grow. Uh, next slide. So this is a design for Ship Point Park. Um, it's currently, again, if you're from Victoria or have been in Victoria, it's currently a parking lot. Uh, almost this entire site right on the water uh, it has been reserved for uh, automobiles for the last 50 years or more. And council, uh, working with the public and the downtown business community has come up with a beautiful uh, space, uh, green space, theater seating, uh, outdoor uh, beach access uh, for, for people. Uh, so we're going to re return, um, as it probably once was, the space from cars to a space for people. And this is very, very important. As you can see, the density behind this space, more and more people are moving into the downtown, including families. And we know that outdoor public space where you don't have to pay to be uh, is really, really important, uh, particularly for people living in, in smaller condos. Uh, next slide. This is another public space which we've designed uh, on the uh, downtown side of the Johnson Street Bridge. So the Johnson Street Bridge, you may have heard about it. It was a very controversial project. Uh, it's actually been a transformative piece of infrastructure when it comes to health and well-being, and I can talk about that in the question period if you like. But this is just another example uh, of making sure that as we uh, develop in the downtown, we preserve and create public spaces where people can gather. The next slide. And that's the park that we're planning uh, on the other side of the bridge. Uh, you can't really see it too clearly, but if you if you can look close up, you see something that says S curve lands. Uh, all of that area there that is going to be park actually used to be roadway. So again, we're reclaiming roadway uh, on the west side of the downtown and turning it into a park. And this park here um, adjoins to, uh, to a walkway that goes all along the ocean. And so this will be under construction this fall. Uh, next slide. But of course, it's not only uh, building spaces that's important and creating public spaces, but it's what happens in them. Uh, and this is one of my favorite examples of what little it takes to create a, a space that's healthy and welcoming and fun for people of all ages, as I'll show you in just a moment. So this is the day, uh, it's kind of a, a fancy, fancified photograph of the day our, our Johnson Street Bridge opened. So on the left-hand side is the old bridge, on the right-hand side is the new bridge. And it was such a controversial project that we really wanted to do something uh, celebratory and invite the public uh, the day it opened. Um, I, I expected that about 500 people would come down to the site. As you can see, we closed the roads and we made it possible for people to walk uh, over the old bridge and the new bridge. And as you'll see with some close-ups later on, we actually put picnic tables on the old bridge deck and, and people came and brought picnics. Uh, but the point, the point of this is just creating a space for people to come and doing something as simple as closing the roads. We actually had 10,000 people show up that day, which was overwhelming and I think illustrates uh, the need and the desire for people just to do something in public space to connect with others. Even though the bridge was way over budget and took too long, people came out to celebrate. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's the picnic tables on the beach, or on the beach rather, on the bridge. So this this is just one example. Uh, all along the bridge, uh, there were just picnic tables set up, which was kind of my fantasy. I said, if we're going to have a party, I want picnic tables on the bridge. And lo and behold, you just set up picnic tables, and this group of people came. They brought their own tablecloth, their own thermos, and they had a picnic on the bridge. Uh, next slide. 
Um, we also set up a table on the bridge for kids to do crafts and invited a local group, the Greater Victoria Placemaking Society, to come and look at the past, present, and future of the site and, and to really have an interactive experience with, with kids. And again, uh, as, as you all well know, making sure that these activities accommodate people of, of all ages and all abilities is important. Uh, next slide. And this was probably the most fun of all. So before the bridge got uh, closed, uh, permanently, we hung up a disco ball uh, and uh, had a DJ, and there was an impromptu dance party on the bridge in the evening, and this is on the old bridge. Uh, next, so we, again, made sure that there was something for, for everyone. Uh, I, I'm just going to whip through some of these quickly. This is Car Free Day, where we close down uh, government, or sorry, Douglas Street uh, on Father's Day every year. And again, we expected a, a small turnout, and every year uh, more and more people come. And I think last year we had a record 50,000 people. And again, it's nothing special. It's just closing down a place that's usually for cars and returning it to people, setting up some tents and creating activity. And next slide. Uh, Buskers Festival is another uh, free and fun use of public space. We do it every year. And it, uh, again, it's just a great time for people to come and gather and make connections and have opportunities that they wouldn't have uh, if we didn't activate public space in this way. Uh, next slide. And, you know, if you want to get away from all the hustle and bustle of all the downtown activities, again, this is a small intervention in public space, but she was created by our parks, worker, parks workers uh, with their own hands. And it, there's a bench uh, a, a beside her. And again, it's just making sure that we balance all the activity with public spaces for, for cont contemplation uh, and, uh, and recovery. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now we're getting into the controversy, uh, and actually it's, it's interesting to be talking about this today because one of the reasons I'm in Ottawa is I'm at the National Bike Summit. So this is the third annual National Bike Summit, and we heard from Canada's public health officer this morning, Dr. Tam, uh, she was the keynote address at the morning, talking again about this idea that public infrastructure and the way we build cities is really important for health and well-being. And so bike lanes, wherever you put them in, are always controversial, and there certainly has been uh, a lot of controversy in Victoria. Uh, but I'm just going to talk through the next few slides about what these lanes are for and in particular who they're for and what they do. Uh, next slide. So I hope you laughed. We're not building the uh, bike lanes for people like this. Uh, this person's going to ride their bike already. They don't need uh, safe infrastructure to do so, although I'm sure they're appreciative of it. Uh, next slide. We're building the bike lanes for people like this. Next slide and people like this and this father and daughter were featured on the front cover slide of my presentation what we've seen since we put this infrastructure in and we just have a two kilometers done so far um, we are constructing there's another three kilometers under construction right now and by the time we're finished in 2022 we will have built a 32 kilometer bike network in a little city like ours which is only 20 square kilometers uh, in in size uh, connected bike network for people of all ages and abilities. And the, the importance of this is, I'm, again, it's not rocket science, is that this little girl and the little girl before her, they're going to get used to the fact that the city is built for them. The city is built for their safety. The city is built for their health. The city is built so they can exercise. And one of the things we started to see since the lanes were put in that lead from the neighborhoods into downtown is more and more parents and kids on their bikes in the downtown, which on the face of it isn't that remarkable. That's what we would expect. But the, the importance, I don't think, can be overstated. People are like, oh, why does it need to be safe? Why do you need to take space away from cars, et cetera, et cetera? And the argument is we need to do it so this little girl and all the little boys and the, the, the seniors who are now back out on their bikes and purchasing electric bikes, and I can talk about that uh, in the question period as well, because it's creating and enhancing a healthy city for them by doing something really simple, taking one lane away uh, from cars. Uh, next slide. <laughs> this is uh, another program we have in Victoria, uh, Cycling Without Age. Uh, that's me on the day they kicked off. But uh, this is a program, I think it, it comes from uh, Amsterdam. And I think we might be the first city in British Columbia, if not Canada, to implement this program. So volunteers bike with seniors. Uh, you can see the gentleman in the front, seniors who are uh, mostly in care homes, don't get out that much. They're strapped onto the front of the bicycle and there's an electric assist at the back and volunteers pedal. Uh, you can actually fit two people in the front there, uh, pedal people around the city through the parks. Again, uh, breaking 
social isolation. Um, the, the tagline actually, as you can see it on the woman's shirt there, is the right to wind in your hair. So again, no matter uh, what age you are, this program believes that um, it's important to, to get out and to, to be cycling or cycled around and again to have uh, the access to public space in a safe way and the Cycling Without Age volunteers have just felt so much safer again since we put the lanes in and so do the people uh, sitting in the front of the seat there. Uh, next slide. And what we're starting to see now uh, as a result of the bike lane development uh, is bike lane uh, oriented development. So some of you might be familiar with transit oriented development where uh, development goes where the transit lines are. Um, this is a site that was vacant before we built the Fort Street bike lane uh, and this whole building, uh, 930 Fort, which is uh, will be under construction soon. It's a private sector development. It's rental, but it's oriented towards the bike lane. They chose the site because the bike lane was going to be there and the, the development itself privileges bike parking rather than car parking. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about how, you know, it's been kind of uh, very positive so far and isn't this wonderful and it's so easy with the exception of the bike lanes. There are also challenges because there are different competing health needs in the built environment. And this project that I'm gonna talk about, this slide and the next slide is one of those challenges. And so what you see here uh, is a layout, and again, the layout's not really that important, although you will see why it is in, in, when I show you the next slide. Uh, a layout for a proposed uh, mental health facility, um, 57 beds of mental health facility, and then uh, mental health housing, so not, not outpatient, and uh, 160 units of affordable housing. This piece of land, uh, 930 Kings Road, is owned by the Capital Regional Hospital District, uh, which I sit on. Uh, and it was purchased very specifically by the hospital district because it already had zoning for institutional use. So the hospital district doesn't need to go through any political process. They could just simply uh, build this uh, as of right uh, with, with what exists right now, with the zoning that exists right now. And certainly in Victoria, we need more uh, mental health facilities. Uh, we need more affordable housing. The uh, surrounding context, though, for this piece of land is that there is another piece of green space, and I should say that this is currently all green space with an old school on it as well. Uh, directly adjacent to this, another piece of very large green space was just developed for 360 units of uh, seniors, uh, seniors health care, so live-in uh, housing for, for seniors. So that's a lot of green space gone from a neighborhood. Uh, the proposal is to put this right next to it. And this is in a low income neighborhood, which has very little green space already and an oversupply of affordable housing. And so this is where it gets, it gets really challenging when you look at whose needs are we balancing. And the residents, and I'll show you their rendition of what they should, what they think should happen here. The residents came uh, and presented to the hospital and housing committee about their vision for the neighborhood, which, which isn't this. And uh, one of the comments made by one of the residents, which is so poignant that I wanted to share with you, is um, how can you, in good conscience, use your health dollars to decrease the health and well-being of our neighborhood? And her point is by taking away much valued community green space and the old school gym, which is used by the community and the community center, we may be providing 57 new mental health beds, but we're potentially um, decreasing the health and well-being. If you look at, as we all do and we all should at health and well-being uh, as, as a, a more broader um, uh, point of view or a broader perspective than just uh, physical and mental health uh, very narrowly. So let's go to the next slide and see what the community thinks should happen there. So that's their vision. And you can see uh, that looming building in the background is the new 360 unit facility. So here we have two very, very different ideas about what health is, what well-being is, what kind of built environment is needed to create health and well-being. And so the, the, the challenge uh, in not only in our city, but in every city is what do we do and how do we weigh these different projects and these different needs uh, off of each other? And I think what we need to do and what we're certainly doing in the city of Victoria is looking at it from a value space. Uh, what do we value as a community? Um, and what, what do, does this particular low income neighborhood value? And then how can we look not only at this piece of land, but at all lands, uh, public lands, school district lands, uh, capital regional district lands in the city and in the area to find a way to balance 
of the health and well-being needs of all of our residents, including those who need uh, mental health treatment and who need those 57 beds, uh, but also this low-income neighborhood uh, that doesn't want their, their school and their green space to disappear. So that's just to point out um, one of the challenges. Uh, and, and that's a very real project that we're in the middle of right now. Um, the remainder of the presentation, and again, uh, I won't take too much longer, is uh, to, to illustrate the importance not only of um, the, the built environment and how that contributes to health and well-being, but also uh, the way that we do engagement and the way that we um, work through with our citizens some of these complexities and the way that we engage uh, university students, the way that we engage um, people in a meaningful way to help shape uh, their their own physical environment and and their city and um, you know remember back to the elements of well-being that I showed at the beginning uh, political voice uh, was was one element of well-being and social connection and belonging was another and so we want to make sure that even as we're building the city we're doing it in such a way that creates a stronger social fabric. So we'll just whip through the next few slides relatively quickly. I am conscious of the time uh, and I want to get to the dialogue. Uh, so next slide. Uh, just as every ma major city uh, in Canada does, um, we have uh, a lot of people who are homeless and living on our streets. And so we had a bit of a novel idea to uh, set up tents uh, inside. This is the old Boys and Girls Club uh, owned by the, the city of Victoria. And uh, people feel secure sleeping in their tents. And so the city said, we've got a vacant building. Why don't we set up tents inside so people can come uh, and, and, and live inside for the winter? Anyways, this was a few years ago now. Uh, the, the building is still open. But what you can see here are a group of volunteers who came and spent the Saturday getting this place ready uh, for the people who were moving in. Again, that, that connection and, and belonging by um, building the city together. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is another amazing program in the city. Uh, it's a partnership between the Mustard Seed and the Victoria Foundation. It's a food uh, rescue operation. And it's, it's the, anyways, uh, maybe I'll save this if anyone has any questions, but they process an amazing amount of food every day. It's redistributed out to neighborhood centers uh, across the region. And again, um, largely volunteer run, as you can see by this very cheerful man in the front. Uh, and it, it, that the connection and belonging people feel by coming together, uh, working on projects that are at the same time building the city and helping with the health and well-being of others. Uh, next slide. Uh, create Victoria Arts and Culture Master Plan. We've done lots of engagement around arts and culture. And again, if I were the queen of the world, I might add uh, one more to the eight bullets at the front of the slide. Uh, and something to uh, something about access to arts and culture and creativity, I think, is, is a core element of well-being. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time working with our residents over the last few years to develop an arts and culture master plan. Uh, next slide. And again, asking the, the question about, uh, you know, what, what do we want to do with the amazing uh, bones of, of arts and culture and creativity in the city? Again, the city didn't just come out with an arts and culture master plan. It really has come uh, from the bottom up. Uh, next slide. And one of the key visions that the community has for uh, arts and culture uh, is to, to use this old building, which is the former Maritime Museum, and uh, it's an old courthouse, and to turn it into an arts and culture hub. Again, uh, the importance of connection and gathering um, for, for uh, creative folks as well. Uh, next slide. This is just a sneak peek of what the inside could look like. And again, there's been an amazing amount of community visioning that's gone on, community-led visioning with city support. And we're in the process of developing a business plan to, to operate that old courthouse uh, subject to the, the provincial government uh, helping us uh, as a gathering space for arts and culture. And one of the things that's come out, and I haven't talked about this too much, and again, I can uh, during the question period, uh, is the, the work of reconciliation in, in everything that we, we do. So the, the, this is a 30,000 square foot building, and the idea is that the uh, bottom floor would be dedicated to Indigenous arts and culture, carving, um, drum making, uh, whatever the Songhees and Esquimalt nations see fit. So that we're uh, establishing uh, on uh, on this space in the Inner Harbor, um, uh, the, the the very living reality, uh, past, present, and future of, of the nation. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a great program at the City City Studio. So we opened up a classroom in the downtown where students from Camosun, Uvic, and Royal Roads 
uh, taught by professors. Uh, the professor will just basically bring a whole class downtown for a semester and work on a real problem that the city is working on. And uh, these classes are amazing. They've got fresh ideas and they're, they're learning uh, about the things that we're working on in real time, but they also give us so much in terms of uh, what, what a healthy city looks like from the perspective of, of young people who want to have a future here. Uh, next slide. Uh, every year we have an engagement summit. Uh, we try things that are a little bit uh, risky, uh, and this activity uh, was one of them. Uh, we asked people to sit in the center and talk uh, about a particular topic, and then the others sitting around the side are there as witnesses listening, and then they swapped and they had to talk about the experience of what it was like to witness uh, versus what it was like to have someone sit there uh, and listen to them. And so, again, in the very way that we're, we're doing engagement, and this was to ask people, what are your priorities? I think it was for 2017 in terms of how we engage you uh, in the very way we're doing engagement we're um, you know asking people to get a little bit uncomfortable but creating a safe space for that to happen uh, and working to create social cohesion which again is a key uh, key element of, of well-being in a healthy community and I think the next slide should say thank you oh one more thing community drop-in uh, uh, again, uh, I have this uh, drop-in session at my office every two weeks. It's remarkable. People actually come and they want to just talk about various issues. Some people come really angry. Some people come with good ideas. Some people come with questions. Uh, but as you can see just from this, I like this photo because it shows the engagement. People come. Again, we sit in a circle unless it gets too crowded, uh, share a cup of coffee and really hash through whatever the issues are that people have. And next slide. And the next slide is the one that says thank you. So that's all for me and uh, happy to uh, stay in on questions or comments. Thank you, Mayor. That was absolutely fantastic. And I uh, love the gorgeous photos that you provided, especially the one my favorite was the disco ball one uh, on the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> like it was a party. <laughs> it, was, it was actually a party on the bridge. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, and it really shows from those photos how much work has gone into engagement with the residents and building that relationships of trust and creating spaces of um, safety so that people can have those sometimes difficult conversations um, and not knowing where it'll go, but just sort of creating those spaces for people to come together and share their ideas. So thank you so much for sharing all that wonderful info. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to open it up now for questions. This is the, the discussion portion of the webinar. So we've got a little less than half an hour with the mayor. So if you have anybody has any burning questions or comments or even just words of appreciation, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, and if you'd like to speak verbally, you're welcome to do so as well. And, and just let me know and I'll, that you'd like to be unmuted. Um, because we're controlling that from here. So if you'd like to be unmuted, just send me a chat message and, and we'll unmute you. And then you can feel free to, to, to pose your questions. Um, as you're thinking about that, I had a few things that I was thinking about. Um, uh, and uh, I had a few questions come up. I was thinking about, um, especially that, that last slide around the, the Victoria City Studio class, I think it was called. And I just love that idea. And, and from what I understood, it sounds like that you are inviting students to come and just have a brainstorm of, about real world, real world planning problems to come up with some innovative solutions and perspectives. Is, is that right? They, they were not really, um, it, it wasn't, uh, it was sort of an invitation to come and discuss something that was actually happening in planning in Victoria? Well, it's, it's actually, it's, they're actually classes. So it started in Vancouver, City Studio Vancouver, and then we, we were the second one. So it's a, a professor will select a topic um, that their uh, their class is going to work on for a semester. So I'll give you a real example. I don't know which, which class that was, but there was, there was a, a public administration class uh, who um, wanted to learn skills of public engagement. Um, and so they worked for one semester with our parks uh, department on creating a community garden on a vacant lot uh, right in the downtown. And so it, it's not just that we invite students in and ask them for their, their input, it's that the professor chooses to work with our staff and then that whole class for a, for a semester is, is structured around the city project. Wow. I love that. I can just imagine the kind of creative conversations that would come up from that. 
Fantastic. I didn't remember that. Um, we had a couple of questions that are popping up. Um, Sue Keller Olaman is asking, how do you see the same processes you have used regarding engagement, drop-in, et cetera, with larger jurisdictions? For example, how do you scale up your successes? It's a great question. I think no matter how many people you have come out to an engagement event, as long as you have the space to convene small tables, um, you can still keep it small. So uh, our public engagement uh, summit this year, we had, I think, 250 people come. Uh, and we have a conference center at the city, so we do have the, the space. And we just made sure that the, the, the day was organized so that there was very little plenary talk and very many uh, small circles and small tables. And again, to, to do that, uh, strong facilitation is absolutely key. Having focused questions for the people who are participating is absolutely key. And really um, making it a genuine opportunity for people to give their input. So I can even imagine, you know, a thousand person uh, engagement summit as long as you have enough space to break people into small groups and, and have the opportunity for those intimate conversations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and Michelle Cam, uh, she's asking what policy framework, whoop, I just lost the question, sorry. I, I see it here. Oh, you see it, okay. Um, I'll just repeat it for people in case they don't see the chat. What policy framework does the City of, Vancouver, of Victoria use to drive the Health City agenda? Um, really, the, the, the work that we're doing, the, the work that we did last term and the work that we're doing this term uh, did, did come, as I said at the beginning, from, from me doing a lot of uh, research and reading into, into health and well-being. And that informed our strategic plan. So we had a, a 28, sorry, a 2014 to 2018 strategic plan that was very focused on, on well-being. Uh, and, and so I guess it's, uh, the, the answer is the precise answer to the question is our strategic plan. Um, if people are interested in looking at it, it's still, uh, it, well, the text has been approved by council, but it doesn't look as beautiful as it will once our staff are finished with it. But if people go to victoria.ca forward slash strategic plan, uh, you can look at our strategic plan. One of the things we didn't do well last term that we are going to do this term is to actually measure. So all I've shared with you are anecdotes. It seems that people are feeling better and doing better uh, with the exception of affordable housing, but that's another challenge and we're happy to talk about that. Um, but we're this this for 2019, we've given our city manager direction to put a measurement framework in place. Uh, and, and when you look at the strategic plan, you'll see that for each objective, we've created measurable outcomes. So we're going to have a measurement framework in place so that over the course of the next term and, and beyond, we'll be able to measure are these uh, actions actually making a difference. So uh, I guess our strategic plan is the key guiding document uh, nested within our official community plan. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's fantastic to know about the measurements as well. And so we'll make an effort to, to share that link with folks afterwards so that you have that uh, the text that um, Mayor Helps was referring to. Um, okay, there's lots of questions. I'll, I'll move on to one from Brian Melnick, who's with the Ministry of Health. Um, he says he enjoys the presentation, building healthy cities is a challenge and not without controversy, such as the bike lanes, uh, which you touched on in your presentation. Um, on another topic, Victoria is also famous in Canada and worldwide, worldwide for its built heritage. It has a look and feel, and how do you see heritage conservation activities fitting into your aspirations for a healthy city? They absolutely do. Um, again, the world is moving really quickly these days. Uh, I, you know, one of my worries is is social isolation, disconnection, um, you know, all, all of those things, and and kind of a, a, a loss of human scale. And so I think cities are a place, and particularly Victoria's Old Town is a place where human scale is is still uh, felt. And our heritage program uh, is it is award winning, and, and again that's resulted in in um, retaining much of our built heritage, particularly in Old Town and in Chinatown. So. Um, it, it absolutely contributes to a sense of, of um, uh, I guess, two things. One, this is a place where I fit in. And two, um, this is a place that has a long, uh, rich history. Uh, and, and I think that that can, can um, provide a sense of stability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, that's perfect. Um, okay, we've got another question from Heather Deegan, who's with Interior Health Authority. 
Um, she says, how involved is the health, oh, and I had this question too. Thank you, Heather. How involved is the health authority in the formation of and implementation of the well-being mandate? So much of this work is, is public health intervention. Absolutely, and to this point, um, other than childcare, so I, we're working very closely with the health authority on a 10-year childcare plan, um, not, there has not been a lot of overlap. And again, it was interesting when Dr. Tam, uh, the uh, public health officer for Canada, spoke this morning here in Ottawa at the, um, at the bike summit. She talked about uh, the need for health authorities to be involved. And she also referenced, and this is something that I'm aware of and, and tangentially involved in, uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Research has a Healthy Cities focus right now. And they're actually um, uh, co uh, seeding collaborations between health authorities and cities. And so that's something that I take seriously. And I think that there's definitely room to work uh, closer with, with our health authority. Our chief medical health officer gets it. Uh, he's a wonderful guy. And I think this, this is right up his alley. So I think there's still more work to do there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and related to that, Florence Morristine is asking, what are the city's connections, collaborations, if any, with the regional health authority, which is it's related to the previous question? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, our, our, our deepest collaboration right now with the regional health authority um, is, is in the creation of a child care plan. Our, our chief medical health officer says that he's actually prescribed child care uh, to people, uh, but the, the, the reality is we don't have enough spaces. So that's our, our most concrete um, collaboration right now. Um, but again, inspired by the Canadian Institute for Health Research and some of their calls for proposals and, uh, and funding opportunities, we are working uh, with the health authority or will be working with the health authority on some other um, uh, topics related to, to built environments and healthy cities. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, and we've got Cora Jansen who's asking if you have any suggestions you can provide for when a city does have a supportive strategic plan or goals or have approved high arching plans like growth plans or active transportation plans, but resistance when items come forward for implementation, either related to the plan or budgeting that's a that's a key question yeah C can i ask a question back to cora just so i can answer it more precisely um do you do you mean um at the staff level or at the political level or both or neither at some other level just so i can be a bit more precise in my answer at the council level right yeah um, um I, I, I don't I'm, yeah, I'm just going to unmute. Oh, Cora says at the council level. At the council Cora, level, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is where uh, political courage is required. I mean, that, that really is the only answer. Uh, and it's not an easy answer. Um, but you know, the more people, you know, when we started out with our bike lane project, it was unanimous at council, nine to zero. Everyone loved it. Uh, and then as the as the resistance started to pour in, we kind of got, you know, eight to one, seven to two. I think the lowest we got down to was six to three. Um, so still, you know, still strong support. Uh, but um, that 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 really is the answer. And it's it's again, it's not an easy answer for me. Um, I don't want to be in this job as mayor for a long time. Um, uh, eight years is good, but even when I was there in my first term, um, I never did anything so that I would get reelected. My time horizon is always 40 to 50 years down the road. Uh, so I think that really is, and, and you know, I, I, I've now repeated this is the third time I'll say it, political courage, but also from, from the point of view of residents, when people are happy with something, they usually don't speak up. It's only when people don't like something. And so in addition to politicians having the courage to act, I think supportive residents that are vocal about their support uh, is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm um, for for the regional health authority. Um, I wonder if there's more that we could be doing in terms of supporting council as as health professionals. Um, Absolutely. Like, yeah, just offering the health evidence and being able to sh to speak with the credibility of a health professional to be able to support those plans by linking it to health outcomes in a concrete way. Um, if we could if we could be doing more around that. Um, do you have any ideas around what else from a health authority we could do to support? 
I think, I mean, that that's really, uh, really important. And again, that came up here at the, the National Bike Summit this morning. Um, active transportation, whether it's uh, walking, cycling, or taking transit, because when you're taking transit, you have to walk or to or from the bus, those those have significant health outcomes. And so when we um, when we're having these conversations at the council table to have support from the health authorities outlining the health benefits. You know, I think one of the speakers this morning made the point that we we undersell the benefits of, of cycling and walking and, and taking transit. And we undersell the health benefits and no one's going to be opposed to good health, right? Like good health is unassailable. And I think that, that, that health authorities could be um, help us to make those links and not only between um, biking and walking, but in terms of, uh, you know, density. Density and, and 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 parks and and all of these things that we need for health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. I often think like it's just it's so appropriate for health to have that voice because when it's framed as a health issue, it's so non-controversial. You know, like exactly. nobody can argue with that. So it takes the it takes the heat out of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? Oh, we've got one more from Maud Lodge. How about affordable housing? I'm not sure what exactly. Maud, can you say a well, little bit more? About I, think it, I think it probably refers to the comment that I made uh, earlier about that we're doing well in all of these areas, but affordable housing is, is still a challenge. Um, uh, one of the, one of the, um, I guess I'll call it an error, although I can't really take too much responsibility for the past. But in Victoria, um, and again, I'm not sure if this is true in cities across the country, although I imagine it is, um, in the 1960s and 1970s, there was very good um, rental housing uh, programs in place, uh, there was a good uh, federal tax incentives for building rental housing, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation had good programs. And so in the 60s, 70s, and, and into the 80s, a uh, little bit, there was a lot of rental housing built. And then it dried up. And so for, for 30 years in Victoria, quite literally, we had no new rental housing built. Uh, there were condos that were, were built and, and you know some of those are rented out. Uh, and so uh, then at the same time, as I showed you those pictures earlier, about Victoria kind of getting discovered as more than a place of hanging baskets and high tea. It's just, you know, it's, it's a booming tech industry. So we've got lots of people moving here from around the world uh, to work in the tech sector, a booming um, marine uh, industry. So, uh, so so no new rental housing built for 30 years, uh, a very uh, booming economy, uh, and so that has really exacerbated the, the housing crisis here. Um, it's it's starting to to creep up a little bit. The vacancy rate it was 0.7 percent. It's now 1.1 percent. But we also have the lowest unemployment rate in Canada. So. Um, with affordable housing, we are working uh, across the spectrum um, from units that rent at 375 a month uh, all the way up to market rental. Um, there's a lot of challenge about is supply enough, what kind of supply. So <laughs> I could come back and do a whole other webinar about the challenges of, of uh, cities and, and affordable housing. But um, I think housing and secure, safe, secure, affordable housing uh, is is key to well-being, and I think that that's one area where we still need to do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we might reconnect with you on your offer to do another webinar on affordable housing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like well, we it would be good. Yeah, we've put some pretty innovative programs in place um, in partnership with the federal and provincial government. They're, they're still in early stages, so we'll, you know, once once we're building between 1,500 and 2,000 units uh, with 400 units that rent at 375 a month, which is the income assistance rate. So once all of those units are, are built or, or well under construction or a portion of them are, are um, habitated by people, um, we, we might have more to say on, on how that's gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay. Uh, so folks, feel free to, to submit your questions. I'll just... Um, I have a few more, if you don't mind, that I, I came to my mind um, as we're waiting. Um, um, and I really appreciate it just to say that you're, when you were highlighting the importance of engagement and, and showing what that means, um, I just think that's so critical to be able to address like when the competing health, health needs and when there's different priorities coming forward, to be able to work that through, through engagement in community. Um, just makes so much sense. And, and you gave the example of the Johnson Street Bridge. 
Um, and I wonder, mm -hmm. for folks on the line that don't know about what the controversy was, um, if you could just <laughs> a little bit more about how, not only what it was, but how you addressed it and the success. Were some, some ways of addressing that more successful than others? Um, and how was your experience with that? Um, sh sure. Uh, so the, the project was uh, undertaken, um, got underway when I was on council. I wasn't the mayor yet. Um, and I, I actually didn't vote in favor of, of the project because it was it was poorly designed. Well, not poorly designed. It was barely designed when we signed the contract. Uh, so there was a lot of uncertainty. There wasn't enough. There wasn't enough funding. I mean, we we were kind of told that oh, it's going to be fine. There's enough funding. But on a project that was uh, only 30% um, designed at best, with a 4% contingency budget. I mean, it just looked bad from the get go. Um, and it it was the case. I mean, it it was over budget late. Um, at a certain point, when I became mayor, I said, okay, yeah, this project is a disaster. I didn't support it, but my job as mayor is to get it done. And we had a, a fantastic uh, project lead on the project at that point. Uh, so, so the project got done. It was it was over budget, um, you know, a couple of years late. Um, but what's remarkable um, is uh, it really has transforms the area. So it's a, the, the, the uh, bridge itself is 50% dedicated to cars and 50% dedicated to pedestrians and cyclists. So there's an entire separate bridge just for pedestrians and an entire separate bridge just for cyclists and pedestrians to share. Uh, and it connects uh, the downtown to the Vic West neighborhood. So uh, I guess, you know, it, the, the, I, I don't know what the lesson to take is. I guess you know you can end up with a good product, even though the the process wasn't very good. And hopefully the bridge is going to last for the next hundred years, like it's supposed to. But I think you know it, again, it, it is a piece of well-being infrastructure because it the, the old bridge was dedicated uh, entirely to cars, and so we we took um, it took space away from cars and, and gave it to bikes and pedestrians. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I had the opportunity of seeing that bridge a couple of weeks ago when I was in Victoria, and I like it. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it is beautiful. It could have been the, the, it could have been probably done for a lot less money and a lot more quickly if we'd actually had it designed before we sent it out to contract. But you know what? That's that's fine, and and the community's happy with it, and and we have our our infrastructure reserves are in very very good shape, which is another really important thing about building a healthy city. We actually have the money to build the infrastructure that we need, and so the reserves were there to fund the cost overruns. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm and it's fifty percent pedestrian, intended for pedestrian, which is fantastic. Yeah, 50% pedestrian and cyclists and 50% for cars. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Um, well, we we don't have any more questions coming in on the chat. Um, and I know that you're tight for time. Um, then you would have another engagement at 12. So unless there's an, any other burning questions, folks, let us know. Um, and I, I will say if anyone, uh, some people, um, I kind of go away and think about things and have questions later usually. So if anyone uh, wants to to contact me directly with any follow up questions or thoughts or ideas or or challenges or anything you think that I need to be thinking about or that you think that we could do together, um, I'm very easy to find. Uh, my email is just mayor uh, at victoria.ca. So please feel free for anyone on the call to uh, to email me if you've got any questions or comments or ideas. Awesome. Thank. You. So much. We we so much appreciate your time, especially knowing that you're at that that bike summit right now. It sounds amazing. Um, and yes, and folks, we're gonna send out mayors the mayor's contact info and the link to the uh, online strategic plan uh, text to you after this call. Thank you again, Mayor, and everyone for participating. Um, it's it's always inspiring to hear you speak. I, I heard about this through one of my colleagues that heard you speak in Victoria months ago and got us all all jazzed up. So I'm, I'm so pleased <laughs> that you were able to present for, at this forum. Um, and a little disappointed that you're not going to run again, but I, I'm so glad we got you while you're, while you're Mayor. Yeah, we've still I've still got three and a half years. I think eight years in a leadership oh. position for for anyone is enough. So three and a half years more <laughs> is a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Yes, you too. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.